morning. Welcome to Believers 2021. Welcome to the Urson Center and uh, to our roaring fire here. This morning I have a good friend of mine, a lifelong friend, Reverend Dan Hickman from Bozeman has come down and I've asked him to come and share. We have a lot of music and preaching and and uh, today we've just chosen uh, a couple subjects that are on everybody's heart and mind, including mine. And, and so there are subjects that Dan knows all about. Five years ago, four or five years ago, we were both living in Seattle. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, circumstances change, and I'm back in Great Falls. And Dan lives in, in the beautiful city, not that Great Falls isn't, of Bozeman. And I've called him down, asked him to drive down today to discuss a couple things. And uh, oh, Dan and I go way back. Uh, we go back to when I first met him was here in Great Falls. He was stationed here at the Air Force Base. That followed uh, a, a time that he had spent in the 70s in Vietnam. We do honor tremendous. They honor your, your, your effort and involvement in, in that tragic war. And uh, Dan has a, a couple boys that were, are in the service and they, were, they are what? They were what? Uh, my oldest spent a year in Afghanistan, and my youngest uh, three tours in uh, Iraq. And uh, my older brother was a Vietnam vet as well as I was. He was there a couple of years before I was. Yeah. Well, we're very glad that the time has come where we can honor our Vietnam uh, veterans and and others, Iraq and, and Afghanistan, wherever. Dan and I uh, played ball together, basketball out at Northwest University, and. Uh, uh, we had a lot of good memories. We were just talking about, we even, we even worked together on the Seattle Times route. We'd drive in a truck around Mercer Island, and, and it was at 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Sitting in a stoplight, and yeah. we waiting for the yeah. red. To... Yeah, we'd, we'd throw the bundles out, and one time we got attacked by raccoons, and we both were running like into the truck, and we had, we had were... all kinds of memories. Yeah, I was. Was uh, involved in Dan's wedding a million years ago, 40, what, 40? 43 years ago. 43, 43 years, years ago. He, he married a, 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 the lovely Colleen and uh, uh, just a tremendous life together that we shared. Four years ago, we were in Seattle. I was the world famous transit driver driving my bus, the double tall and the ones that bend in the middle and in and out of Seattle four or five times a day, blah, blah, blah. I saw all kinds of things. I drove out there for nearly 15 years. All kinds of things you see in Seattle, you don't quite always see in Great Falls. And uh, as Time passed and ended up being in the, at the Northwest University as a dean of the a students there, involved in student activity. Then he went on to become chaplain on First Avenue of Seattle, First Avenue, right downtown Seattle, near the near the market that most of you have been to if you've been to Seattle. At a time when Seattle, well, Seattle's never necessarily not been. Uh, uh, it's it's always been a little dicey uh, as, as long as we've known it. The last few years, as you know, as on media and on things happening in Seattle, been more than dicey. Four or five years ago, I was driving on First Avenue through Seattle. Dan was a chaplain on First Avenue with the Union Gospel Mission. Union Gospel Mission, and uh, in as a result of that, he had many experiences. How many years were you down on First Avenue? Oh, probably five or six. Yeah, if you live five or six years down on First Avenue. Uh, a tremendous uh, man of uh, faith and patience. Well, that's what Dan has and, and inspiration, and he was down there. Well, then he moves to Bozeman, and I, I, I just asked him to come, and I want to talk about a couple subjects, or at least have him share uh, subjects, uh, subjects of, of addiction, alcohol, drugs, human trafficking. Uh, and it is not just something that happens in, in the big cities. It happens everywhere, all through Montana, uh, the, the addiction, the issues, the heartache exists. And so, Dan, I just want to start with, with this po uh, position in this place in, in, in our narrative. How do you end up being, uh, like if one of these, one of the individuals watching on TV and their ch child ends up on First Avenue, how do they end up being shown up on First Avenue, addicted, lonely, in, 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 and desperate, and in, in a very dangerous situation? Well, Mark, thank you for having me, but uh, over the years, working with homeless and people that were really struggling with functionality in life, uh, you find that there are some common denominators in just about every one of them. 
Um, one would be, of course, we could trace back to basically a dysfunctional home life. And it doesn't always have to be uh, a, a life that uh, is a parent that's maybe addicted themselves or not. Of course, that's very common, but uh, there's a lot of times that we'd find somebody that had good parents, but those parents would not maybe not uh, teach boundaries. And they would maybe, uh, another common part of, of their lifestyle would be that every time that something happened to that person as he grew up, it was somebody else's fault. It was either a bad teacher or a bad coach. In other words, they were blaming everybody for the failures or the problems they were having in school or whatever. And then there was one other really common denominator that I found, and that would be that there was almost invariably a lack of purpose, a feeling that my life actually has a reason to be here, that I have a function in my life, uh, a purpose for doing something. But what, what, what role do the, does the alcohol or the drugs play in that? So you have a lack of purpose. Why do people turn to drugs or alcohol to the degree that it actually captures them? Well then, you would actually find a lot of times that this dysfunctional led to an excuse to experiment with drugs or to experiment with alcohol. And of course, with no restrictions on their behavior, no real accountability, um, even though, um, I mean, kids are normal. They want to try out, they want to push the boundaries. And almost always, whenever a person begins a, a lifetime of involvement with drugs or with alcohol, they are set it them, themselves right at the start at that level of of their life for the next however long they live. In other words, let's say you started drinking uh, when you're 13 or 14 or experimenting with drugs when you're 15 or 16. Well, now you might be 45 or 50 years old, yet your, your life maturity, mm -hmm. how yeah. you respond at life, it's still at 13 oh, or 14. Oh, you interrupted, so that's where you start. Yeah. And so you're not dealing with somebody that's sitting across from you that's 30, 40 years old. You're dealing with a 14 or a 15 year old. Basically, that it's really hard to separate, but then you begin to understand that your responses, the way that you approach life is at that level. But so, the, the kids that would, and not only kids, you had all ages come in down. When right. I went there and spoke that night, there were all ages there. But, All ages. But they're almost invariably, you're dealing with them at that level where they first started. So you've got to kind of keep in the back of your mind that, well, I'm, I, like I'm looking at you as an adult, but if I was dealing with you as your counselor or your chaplain, I have to remember I'm not dealing with an adult, I'm dealing with a juvenile. And so that's really going to affect a lot of how they respond to not only your teachings, but life as a whole. And when a person is immature at that level, um, an addiction or whatever behavior that they've got, it becomes easier and easier if you don't teach them or bring them back to a place of accountability and restrictive behavior. So you, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is when a person starts out at a fairly young age, starting with an alcohol or whatever, once they've lapsed into that, it's just like a juvenile. They're just gonna stick with that behavior again and again, the easiest course of action. They're not going to take, like, okay, when you're a, an adult, do you get up and go to work, mm -hmm. um, even if it's a hard day, even if you're tired and you want to stay in bed and it's cold outside, you still do that. Why? Because you're responsible. Well, we have to bring that person back to that kind of responsibility of their of their life, of their behavior, teaching them that you can't just take the easy route over and over and over again, which was what they've done. Without accountability, yeah. When, when, you, when you view the, the number of people coming through that union mission and you were there four or five years, is it about a 50-50 split between those addicted to drugs and those addicted to alcohol? Or is, is there a predominance, one or the other? Um, if I would go back over and say in six years there, I would say that, that drugs were probably a little more prevalent than alcohol. Uh, in fact, um, both behaviors are are uh, very, um, well, it's hard to, to identify, but a person that's, uh, actually, I, I guess I would say that a person that was addicted to alcohol, it was a little easier sometime to deal with them. Um, 
there wasn't quite as the likelihood of them even slipping back into um, a, a careless life or a, a dysfunctional life nearly as as deep as they did when they were coming. Yeah. Drugs are drugs were a hard mark. I mean, this it's not a joke. It's just really beyond what you can understand. Well, you had some very dangerous moments there too, didn't you? I mean, yeah, I would. I, I don't want to overplay this, but when I was with, <laughs> when I was with you, I, I you know I I just know it was that the Lord protected you in in because there's some. They hit moments of desperation. Is that is that an appropriate thing to say? Most generally, uh, alcohol you would find you you've got uh, we've stereotyped them for years, but you have happy drunks, angry drunks, whatever. And yes, alcohol does uh, affect a person's behavior and, and their growth. But when it came to the drugs, that's almost a minefield that you can't really always predict because. Uh, uh, a guy can get so desperate for to feed his addiction, he has no sense of responsibility or any right behavior. He's going to get that next eye, and that is scary. No, that's right. And that was my thought on as I would transport people through. I can't say everything I know about uh, what happened on our on our transit uh, situation, but. It, their need, they needed, a, they needed whatever a fix or whatever, they, whatever the deal with a pill, whatever it was, they they didn't care. They would take, it, they needed it right now, and it was very, very dangerous. And it took me a, a few years of driving to realize that I was the driver. I wasn't the, I wasn't the policeman. I wasn't the drug agency. I better, and I better keep keep my way out of it. Let me switch topics in just a little bit. So you have these desperate lives, these destroyed lives, alcohol, drugs, kids, middle age, even older people. What had to happen to them so they would reach the point where they would come down and come knocking on your door on First Avenue? What, what would possess someone to even be identified with the Union Gospel Mission? I mean, it wouldn't be, it, wouldn't, it wasn't cool to walk into your doors, I wouldn't think. Well, at first, uh, if you've been there a while, you begin to identify that People are just normal. And of course, the weather. Some people will come in and they've got a warm bed or they can get a, a cot and, and a good meal. And so we would see an increase in our uh, uh, residents go up as soon as October would come in the colder weather. But if you really want to see the guy that was going to get better, that was there because he wanted to, you know, whatever brought him to that point, it's almost going back to the Word of God where you find out that Jesus tells you about a man who um, was blind forever. And finally, Jesus is talking to him and he says, do you, what do you want me to do? That's an interesting question. I mean, the man had been blind his whole life. So why in the world would the Son of God turn to him and said, what do you want me to do? Well, obviously, there must have been a reason for that question. And that really goes into the man's heart. Do you really want to see again? Mm. I mean, it's pretty convenient to be blind. You got your needs met, mm. people take care of you. Uh, they feel sorry for you. You don't have to get up and work. You don't have responsibilities. And so Jesus was looking beyond the physical need to the man to the heart. And I think sometimes in a ministry like ours, you have to find that there are going to be a lot of people that are really there. They don't really want to get built well. Maybe it's for a temporary season. Maybe for a little while they want to get warm or they want to, you know, try to make a few changes in their life's conveniency. But the guy who really, really wants, when he's reached that point that I want to get well, and I don't want to blame anybody else. I don't want to blame my mom, my dad, my coaches, or whoever. I want to get well because I've screwed up my life. That guy is on the road to getting better. Yeah, and I know we're talking about the Union Mission on First Avenue in Seattle, but I think of all the parents who deal with children uh, or at any age, or just adults, and the, the sorrow and the suffering that alcoholism and that drug addiction causes, and, and how everybody's sorry, everybody feels bad, and, our, our, and your heart goes out to the, to the victim, your heart goes out to the victim's family, and then you come to the seem to come to this cross point, the very point you're making. That is, well, what are we going to do about? Here's where we are. How do we move it to where you can beat this thing? And if there's a, re a resistance to growth, a resistance to change, 
a resistance to the paying the price you have to get to get out of drugs, then I think what, and I know we're not talking about just teenagers, we're talking more, but I guess it applies. What do you do when you're put in a position as, as, a, as the parent and you're the facilitator now? They won't step up, they won't make that decision to say, what, what do you want? I want to be, I want out of this. I want to be, I want to change my life. And they kind of take three steps back and there you are. They're still your child. You don't want to see them in jail. You don't want to see them on the streets. So, it, so, so, what, what, <laughs> so what do you do then? Then they, then they end up leaving the home eventually and that's how they get down on First Avenue. Mark, guilt is a big, big thing in life. And a lot of parents feel like it's, wow, well, I must have been a bad parent. My kid wound up in drugs or in alcohol. What did I do wrong? First of all, you gotta bring yourself to the understanding that people make decisions on their own. It's your decision. I don't care, uh, you can blame somebody else, you can blame anyone you want, but until you come to the place, and Jesus made that very clearly to people, you have to take accountability for your own life. So if you're a parent and your child is struggling, you have to come to the first place to say, even if they're old or they're young, remind yourself, your job's not to be a friend of your kid. Your job is to be the parent. And being a parent isn't always a nice feeling. You have to say no and you have to learn to draw boundaries and you have to, you know, take that, maybe they're going to say, I hate you or I don't want you. That doesn't matter. Good parents understand something. You love your kid even though it's tough. You're not going to be Mr. Popular or whatever. So quit blaming yourself that your kid turned out the way they are. They still made their well, own can choices. I, can, yeah, can I interrupt you for a minute? Did you experience a lot of young people or, or middle-aged people or whatever come in and they basically tell you, I, I am this way because of my family, because of my parents. And, 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 and they, it might, they, it might, there may be some elements of truth to that, but I what, what, what are you going to do? I had a guy come in, and this is a hard story to tell, but it's a true story. He had been uh, living in addiction almost uh, 40 years. And uh, when he was, you know, first come into my caseload, what he told me was, I'm the way that I am because it's, and he'd been through several programs over and over again. He was the way he was because it was, when he was 15, his father, uh, had uh, um, molested him and that impacted his life and from the time that he was a teenager all the way through an adult that he actually when he was an adult he molested a young person too wound up going to jail the child, the child yeah. yeah so now he's coming in my office and he's running the same um, story that he's had for 40 years. I'm the way that I am because my father molested me. I had this problem. And every time in an AA meeting or whatever thing that we were doing, he was, I'm this way because I'm like my father. I'm this, I'm this, and this. Finally, you know, of course I've been praying for him and I, I brought him into my office and, I, and during one of our sessions together, I said, let me ask you a question. I want you to go back to your room and I want you to write down five things that you appreciated about your mom. Just five things, because he had never mentioned his mom. She had died when he was well, probably 20. So he went back to his room, and a couple days later he came back in and he wrote down these five things. And I said, do you realize that everything that you wrote right here about your mom are the very same things of the traits that you like about, we've liked about you? And I said, you've been telling yourself for ever and ever and ever, you're like your father. The real truth is you are actually more like your mother. And when he began to, to see that, I'm, I'm, I'm not making this up. There was like a light came on and I remember him crying in my office and he goes, I never thought I was anything like somebody else. I always thought myself, this was the way I am because I'm like my father. Mark, he turned his life inside out when he began to realize that his identity wasn't locked into somebody else, but it was locked into the, he was actually more like another person in his life who he really loved and respected. 
And I think that God sometimes wants us to quit looking for excuses for our behavior and come back to, hey, guess what? Maybe I can be set free if I quit blaming everybody else, take responsibility for who I am and decide that I want to change. Yeah, I appreciate what you're saying. Uh, tough love doesn't sell very well all the time in, in today's world. It doesn't want, you know, I'm, I it wouldn't sell up to me either if I if that was the if that was the way it was presented to me. But it has to be that way. It has to be a tough love. There has to be a willingness. A parent kind of has to be willing to say, "Hey, this is the route you have to go, or you have to leave." I think that sometimes I'm going to go back to something I learned before I went to Vietnam. You see, sometimes whether it's a drug or the alcohol, we got to remember that these are wars. These are wars against us as people. And are going to steal our children. And we've got to teach our children, and, and I don't care how old they are, that this is not a game. This stuff is taking our lives. It's going to kill you. It's maybe not going to kill you physically, but spiritually and emotionally and in many ways of your life, it's going to rob you and destroy you. When I first was in combat training before going to Vietnam, we were down in Texas, and I can remember some of the guys didn't think it was a big deal. We're Americans. We're going over to Vietnam. We're the big bullies on the block. We treated it like we were going to war, and it was a joke. But I remember one of the sergeants coming out one day, and we were at a firing range, and he went out, and he put a piece of concrete out there and he goes, uh, okay, boys, you're gonna be in a firefight over in Nam. And he says, uh, what would you, you do if you were in this firefight? And, and, and he says, would you hide? Would you hide there or hide there behind a tree? And he says, how about you would hide behind that uh, piece of concrete over there? And we all, yeah, yeah. He slapped a round or 20 rounds uh, and uh, clip into his M16 and he turned around and he pointed it down maybe 40, 50 rounds or 40, yards down and he shot that piece of concrete and it was just a little teeny thing when he was done. And he looked at us and he looked me right in the eye. He said, now where are you gonna hide, sucker? And he says, you guys are not going into a game. There's somebody out here whose whole intent is to destroy you and to take your life. And I think that as a parent, we have to remember our children and our, our families God wants us to be just as tough as that DI or that sergeant was to me and realize, hey, this is not a joke. And I don't expect you to like me. I don't expect you to always love me. But I do expect you to understand I'm going to do everything I can to prepare you to go into this world. Yeah. I, I, and I, I go back to seeing the kids, of course, in the, the rural life in America, et cetera, et cetera. And I go back to wondering, you, they come down to, to the Union uh, mi mission because of the bad weather, but uh, uh, also they come for help. They come because they've been asked out of their own homes. They've lost their jobs. They need a place. You had people staying. Didn't, they slept at night, didn't they, in, in, in the mission. Then they had to get up and what they had to do, go out and work or something during the day? I think that I want to go back to a key point about this in a battlefield. The Bible says that the enemy comes, he's to steal and to rob. You have to ask yourself, when in my life do I have that the enemy wants to rob? And uh, he's not going to rob your salvation because once you become right. saved, nothing can separate you from his love. Right. So what do you have that he's going to try to rob you? It's from a fulfilling life. He's going to do everything he can to destroy the abundant life that Jesus told us about. Not a rich life, but a life full of purpose, a life full of, 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 of things that, that matter. That your life is not built on what you have, but what you're giving. And if he can do anything to steal that, that sense of fulfillment from you, he's going to do it. So we come to the drugs today, or alcohol, either one. And you see the message that's put in front of us. Hollywood mostly makes the drug community look like a joke. You can get high, no problem. It's not a big deal. Um, sometimes if you see a stoner, they're going to make fun of him. And even when it comes to um, uh, commercials on TV, when it comes to whatever alcohol, we make mostly uh, we make it look like no big deal. It's pretty. People are you know, the fit, whatever, uh, attractive. We do everything to give you the message. 
Right now in Montana, we just uh, recently had a, a legislation across the state to legalize grass. No big deal. They do it in Seattle. They do it in Portland. That's because the people that are telling you this don't live down on First Avenue. Mm -hmm. The mayor of Seattle doesn't come down to First Avenue. Mm -hmm. They don't tell you about these young people that are 35 and 40 years old that are restricted down at 13 because they started taking drugs and alcohol when they were there. And they're still those same kids, even though they're an adult. And now all of a sudden we've legislated this idea that it's, we're not gonna prosecute you for drugs. We're not gonna do anything against you. We're just gonna, it's all fine, no big deal. And we don't realize it's like putting a $50 bill in a kid's hand and sending them into the candy store. These guys can't make rational decisions. They can't handle that uh, freedom that we've given them. And because of that, it's taking their lives away. They, they've got to do something to keep that high, to get themselves, uh, they, they don't know how to live a good life. They just know how to get a high. So they, so, so if I might interrupt. So they go through this whole downhill spiral in Seattle and Great Falls and anywhere in, in any rural t town in Montana has alcohol and drugs. I mean, it's it's not just a, a big city thing, but I, I, I would drive down and look and, and not just one or two people sleeping on the sidewalk, just sleeping and you'd step over people Wasted life. I think it's. I think it is John ten ten. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And that is the war you're talking about. I perceive. We have fifteen thousand homeless in Seattle. Fifteen thousand, Mark. Fifty or fifteen. Fifteen. Fifteen thousand. Fifteen thousand on the streets and under the bridges. And, and of course, they're going to turn around and say, "Well, these people are unemployed. These people are, you know, their family." If I could, again, because I worked where I work, and because I know what I know, I would say probably there is at least 70% of the people that are homeless. It's a lifestyle choice for them. They choose that because you've given them the that opportunity. Is, Seattle was known yeah. in the homeless community as uh, free out. No, it, no it, and that's hard for people to realize that many, and, and I don't want either of us be perceived as being insensitive, but many would choose that life. We, they get up, they, it's a mild climate for the most part, they get up, not a care in the world. You see them walking for breakfast, walking back. Uh, I, I, I know that we need to be sensitive to them, to, to everyone, to anyone. But this, this muddling of the mind that takes place as a result of drugs is, is, is uh, and alcohol is just beyond measure. In a minute, I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna take a little break here, I'm just gonna ask you about, uh, about what you've seen, what you've experienced that has truly been helpful to re reprogram uh, these minds. Well, there you go. <laughs> We're collecting ourselves here in our studio audience at uh, Believers, the Ursuline Center, 23rd Street and Central Avenue. You even remembered it was Central Avenue, didn't you? It's been 30 years since you've been in, yeah, in town. 30 years. Uh, Dan awesome. had a lot of memories here in Great Falls. And when he was here, he had a 1975. No, what? 72, no, 70, oh, okay, 72 but, Nova. 72 Nova 350. Yes. Yes. I had a, I had a 62 Nova six cylinder three on the column so i mean we definitely had two different types of cars he was a he was one that went down central avenue and waved at people back in the days of the, of the what they call it when you went down the the, the uh, when you quit when you cruise central and i was cruising first avenue in my rambler station wagon so enough of that back to back to uh the issue of people find themselves in this situation where, where the enemy has stolen maybe their resolve, maybe their ability to even monitor themselves, to control themselves. Now they're addicted. And where do we go from here? Well, one of the keys, at least from my caseload, I was very fortunate to be able to bring a lot of the men back to this one point. And I would ask them a question very early in our, our sessions together. What is your purpose? In other words, why are you here? Not just why are you in this room, but why are you on this planet? 
what is it about you that that makes you want to be alive? Well, they can't. They couldn't have told you I have a purpose. No. But if I could work them back towards why did God ever put you here? Because we're trying to center everything around God. Because I, you know, I work for the Seattle Union Gospel Mission. Yes, but we showed the highest percentage of of recovery than any other um, entity in Seattle. So what was the thing that's kind of helping these men to change? That's and right. We have to bring what, it was, back. what was it? We have to bring it back to the gospel. But if you're going to bring them back to the gospel, then you have to bring them back to Jesus. And if you're going to bring them back to Jesus, you're going to have to bring them to the point. Why did God put you here? Why are you here? And if you have a purpose, if, if you can understand that God didn't just make you here because you're an accident, but you actually have a calling or a reason for being alive, then we can start at there and bring back recovery. Well, that sounds so boring. Don't, don't, don't the people, when you tell that to the men, don't they just say, hey, I'm here, I don't want to hear this stuff, and out the door they go? No. Uh, a lot of times, uh, again, it comes back to them. Are you serious about recovery? If a guy walks in the door and doesn't want to hear how to how to recover, then I know that he's really. I I I, I have to be be really really careful that I'm not I'm not here doing something to notch a, a batting average or uh, uh, inflate my my uh, uh, record. I'm here because I want you to get better. I want you to recover. I want to love you enough as a human being to offer you a way to a life like Christ offers. And if I'm going to do that, I can't play games with you. If you're not here for the right reasons, with the right motives, with a heart that's really sincere, I'm just wasting my breath trying to help well, you. Let me cut in on that, Vince. Can somebody else say, you get down the union mission and they'll take care of you and so you 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 come to the mission not based on a, on a desire you want but your parents want you there or your wife wants you there or your husband wants you there All or your time. school wants you there so there you sit you don't really want to be there you don't really want to change but you're there because somebody else told you to get down there all the time uh i had a, a young man from down in denver uh, he was uh related to the, in our family and and uh um, they heard about me working downtown, and, and uh, he got caught with the drug community down in, in Colorado. He family wound up flying him up to Seattle because I was able to get him into the mission. And he was sitting in my office. He's probably 20, 21 years old, goofing around with drugs. That's just, he didn't see any problem with it. He knew he was going okay, it cost him a job or two, but nothing big thing. He could look out the street out the windows around my office. And he began to see things that I don't think he had ever realized before. He was seeing people that, we had people walking naked down the street. Uh, we had people it. exposing themselves. We had people living in their own vomit. Mm -hmm. I mean, defecating on the sidewalks. Uh, the, the drugs and uh, uh, the, 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 just the overall community all around, with the, outside our walls, was an eye opener. He looked out there and he saw where he was headed. I remember his thing in my office and he was just crying and he's going, I never realized, I never realized it was like this. And I remember turning to him and saying, that's exactly what the enemy wants you to do, to think that you, uh, the, this doesn't cost you anything. Mm -hmm. and, and that if he can hide the reality of where you're headed and what, what, what the real course that you're on right now he's done his job he's got you fooled and it was though that whole weekend i remember him coming in and, and finally coming and saying i i will never ever ever could do this again and uh um he now is a dad he's got a wonderful wife and a beautiful kid and he's never ever gone back to that life because it opened him up well i know let me ask you this then reverend daniel hickman <laughs> If you were had a thousand high school kids from Great Falls, Great Falls High, C.M. Russell, all the high school kids from around, you have one opportunity to talk to them. They're in they're, they're in a position where they haven't taken their life down and be dependent on either alcohol or drugs. You had one shot. You had they they all they all were sitting there. You had uh, 
the principal said, or the superintendent said, uh, Pastor Hickman will give you 10 minutes. What would you, what would you say? That's a good question. I, I, uh, that's all put a lot of pressure on me to make the difference in their life. And, and, and I don't have that strength to, to, to do that. I, I guess if I only had 10 minutes to them, I'd turn around and say, I'm not going to lie to you. And I'm going to tell you the truth. It's, there's somebody out that's real, that's uh, doing everything he possibly can to steal an mm -hmm. abundant life from you. He, I, I think that a lot of people spend their time worrying about heaven and hell and not realizing that hell can really be right here on this earth and that you could be living uh, a, a, a life that, that has lots of gadgets and lots of uh, things and be empty on the inside. And when you look back over it, you can shake your head and say, wow, I really, really blew it. And I think that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants you to... Um, let me tell you a story, and I would tell that to them. I would say that um, it was I was coaching at Northwest when I was dean of students. I was coaching with the basketball team, and we were down on a road trip in Idaho. And so we came back from a game that Saturday night, and I went into the hotel, and I was it was 10:30 at night, and I decided to watch TV. So I turned on ESPN, and it was the defensive, uh, or it was a college. Um, honor. They were showing all the great college players and giving the awards. And uh, the defensive player of the award, award was, was being uh, offered and the announcer was showing up these three different football players across the country that were really great. And they finally chose this kid named David Pollock from Georgia. They said he's the defensive player of the year. You saw this kid get out of the audience and run up to the uh, platform there and and the announcer was going well, gg david we, we can just tell that you're so excited it's acting like you, you you're so surprised we called you he said oh man i can't believe you chose me he said that kid from oklahoma is really great and the guy from texas is just as good i can't believe you chose me david and the guy said well david we watched you play four years of college football at georgia and you were always so fun to watch you were in every game and you're encouraging your teammates and you were looking like you were having so much fun even if you weren't playing you were just you know you were just really joy and that's when the holy spirit spoke my heart and said listen to what he says next and just when the guy said, we loved how you played football, this kid, David Pollock, said, yes. And he said, I always thought it, that when it came to playing football at Georgia, that instead of crying when my career was over, I wanted to laugh that I even had it. And to me, that's when God said, isn't that your goal in this life? Instead of crying when your life comes to an end, don't you want to laugh that you even had it? And that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants you to cry that this life is over, that you're getting old, that you're not as good as you used to be. And, and, and he wants to steal the joy of being who you are in your life and, and looking back over and saying, man, I'm laughing because I, my life has been full, my family, I've been so blessed to have the friends that I've had. And it's not about the things that I've got, it's about the life I've been allowed to live. And I would tell those kids, there's an enemy that wants you to cry that your life is over. And there's another God named Jesus Christ that wants you to laugh that you even had it. Yes. Well, you have 10 minutes <laughs> with the Great Falls High and the CMR and all of the young people. I, I'll tell you that it's a hard thing. I think that and I think of this relationship between and for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. There's consequences for decisions you make. And if anything I see in the media or other things is the absence of consequences, and you get to thinking there are, no, there are not gonna be consequences, and the next thing you know, the consequences of your decisions hit you like a tsunami. And you wiped out and your potential has been reduced and certainly your joy. We know that we want young people and even not so young people to meet the Lord as their personal savior. They don't need religion. They need a supernatural touch. They need, a, they need their heart changed. They need the spirit to come and live within their life and to help them through this life. And we just can only, that's why the gospel must go forward. Uh, I appreciate uh, what 
you were telling me earlier that uh, of the people that come, what was the percentage you think that, that of those who come that actually would, would leave and stay, stay uh, on track? Well, I was actually able to list after five years over 25 guys that were on my caseload that I can honestly say God healed them and that I know they made major changes in their lives. And uh, as far as I know, uh, many of them are still sober, if not all of them. Uh, I had a guy on my caseload. Um, he was he had been a drunk most of his life, and he was in his 50s. And uh, I can still see him. Uh, his name was Tracy. And uh, he, uh, he hadn't had a very good life, made a lot of mistakes. And uh, the, when I first came to the mission, he was a driver, and he was a horrible driver. We'd laugh because he'd have to drive us downtown, and he'd come so close to hitting this car or another. And when he ever parked, he'd put dents in it. And I can remember he'd always come in, and probably at least five times he banged into another car or something like that in, in parking lots. And uh, almost invariably, administration would, well, we can't have this guy be the driver. And, and that was all he did was drive for us. I mean, that's the only reason he, that was his job. And I remember him coming in and, and he'd be crying and he'd say, I screwed up again. And I'd say, Tracy, as long as I'm your case manager, you're going to be the driver. And I'd bat, go to bat for him. Even if he screwed up, I, I, I'd give him another chance, give him another chance. And uh, finally he was in and he messed up and one more time gave him a, 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 uh, this really cool thing had happened. He'd contacted his son from way back in his background and the son had responded. We'd, we'd searched and found him and his life was coming together. And I remember sitting on a, on a Monday in my office and saying, he's crying. And he said, for the first time in my life, he said, I, I feel like uh, I have a reason. I feel like I'm, I'm not a failure. That night he went back into the study. And when I drove into work, Next morning, there was an ambulance in front of our facility, and they were carting his body out of the out of the facility. He had died in his sleep that night. Mm -hmm. But the last words he had ever said to me is, "I don't, for the first time in my life, feel like a failure." And I I, I keep going back to that that God doesn't want um, to steal from us. He wants to give us another chance. Let me add one more thing. I think sometimes we make a mistake and we read the Word of God with a saran wrap over our brain. And I would tell guys in my office over and over again, I said, there's probably a Bible story you remember, and it's called Lazarus, when Jesus went to the tomb and Lazarus had been dead for four days. And I said, you may would always remember the story. And I said, now I'm going to ask you a question, a theological one. I said, uh, Jesus is standing there in front of Lazarus' grave, and he says, roll away the stone. And I said, why did he ask him to roll away the stone? And of course they said, well, he's gonna raise him from the dead. I said, that's right. So why did he tell him to roll away the stone? Because he's in the tomb. No, no. I said, why did he tell him to roll away the stone? Why did he just say, roll away the stone, and, or stone, roll away, Lazarus come forth? I mean, after all, if you're going to raise a man from the dead, how hard would it be mm -hmm. to remove a rock? And I said, because God is telling you something. He's telling all of us something. He said, do what you can do and leave the miracles to me. Yeah. And I said, some of you parents can reach out to your kids. Some of you can write letters. Some of you can forgive. There are things, you want a miracle in your life. You want to overcome your addiction. There are things that you can do. You do what you can do and leave the miracle to God. And time after time after time, I've seen God answer in a miraculous way when a person is willing to do what they can do and let God do the miracles. Oh, that's a very good point. Not only in alcohol or drugs, addiction, any kind of situation uh, that when we don't do what we can do, but we're, we're, I guess we have a view, even Christians, of God being a genie in a lamp and, and he should, we should rub this and do that, and say these magic words. And, and, and I just, we just, have to receive and i pray that the holy spirit is speaking to lives this morning we need to make room for the holy spirit to have uh, uh, to be the captain to drive our ship 
to, to guide us, to lead us, to inspire us, to move us forward, so that we do what we can do. We do take the course that we can take. And we're running out of time right now, but I, 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 I've, the sad thing is I've, I drove right by where you worked, and I, for blocks, this way, coming, going, leaving, there were bodies literally on the sidewalk all over. And it is true that of the, like you mentioned, the men and women who, uh, who, did, who did receive healing, the sad reality is hundreds and hundreds did not. Hundreds and hundreds walked away broken and, uh, and from the Union Mission on First Avenue, it's downhill from there. If you don't get your act together at the Union Mission on First Avenue, from there it's very, down, very much downhill. We got five more minutes. Pastor Reverend, Most Reverend Daniel Mark, Hickman. Mark, I had a guy who had been through 14 programs. 14. He'd been through our program four times when he landed on my caseload. He's 50-some years old, alcoholic, since he was 13. And I remember praying and asking God, what am I going to do to help him? What can I do to, that he hasn't heard before? I mean, he's, he's read the book. He'd gone through the books every time. He knew more about our books than I did. And so I can remember when he first approached me, like, oh boy, one more guy that's going to try to con me. And for 40 some years, he'd been addicted to alcohol. I remember going out and praying one night and saying, God, what can I do to change this guy? Because I'm not going to give him anything that, I, that he hasn't already heard before. So the next time he came to my office, the Holy Spirit had put something in my heart. And I, I said, I'm going to ask you to do one thing, just one. I said, I don't care. You, know, you won't have to do anything else. There's nothing on my caseload that I'm going to require of you. But this one thing for the next week. And I said, I want you to find somebody in this building that's doing something right. And I want you to go to them and tell them that you've seen this. And he begged me, please don't make me do that. Because he, he was very into himself, introverted. And I, I said, nope, you're going to find somebody and tell them they're doing something right. You're going to build somebody up. So he grudgingly said he would do it. Two days later, he comes in and he said, well, I did it. I found one of the guys who was helping us make sandwiches. And he said, I watched him. He's really been, always does his job and always, always never complains or anything. I finally went up, got my courage, and I said, man, I really appreciate what you're doing. And, 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 and he felt so much better about himself after he did that. Well, that weekend, they, uh, they had a, an evangelistic service up in Everett. And uh, Billy Graham's son, Franklin Graham, was doing a service up there. So they took the bands up there. And on Monday, my guy comes into my office and he, he says, uh, something happened on Saturday night. I said, what? And he said, well, I was sitting at the, Bill, at the Franklin Graham thing and that guy that I complimented to came back and found me at the very end. They were doing an altar call and he, he asked me, he said, would you mind going forward with me and uh, go forward for me? And so uh, my guy is sitting there and he goes, so I went up to the front of them and he received Christ. And my guy sat there and he goes, does that mean God can use me? And I said, that's exactly what God can use you. I don't care about your past, neither does God. He can use you right where you're at. That guy had been addicted to alcohol for 45 years. It's four years now since that night. And he hasn't touched a drop of liquor because he found that he had a purpose. That's very good. We have to go. I wish we had more time. Uh, Dan told me a story of, of a guy uh, at, at Penny's who resisted the credit cards when everybody on the board wanted credit cards. And there was one, there was one person who resisted it. Correct me if I'm not, if I'm wrong, because he couldn't, he could see that it could lead to some real addiction. And his name was J.C. Penny Sr. J.C. Penny Sr. said, no, if we go credit cards, he saw how easy it was. Addiction comes in many, many, many ways. And uh, uh, I, 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 I hear what you're saying, Dan. I'm very glad that you came down to share with us this morning. Uh, the, the war, really, you know, we, could, we talk in nice soliloquies. We can make it as sweet as we want it. Fact of the matter is, there is a battle out for minds, soul, spirit, a battle in America today. We know that in every way possible. And we would just encourage, I'm sure you would, do we just encourage parents, 
uh, 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 adults, you just have to do what uh, Pastor Dan was saying. You just have to decide. Do you want to get well or do you not? Is it your heart's desire to find someone to take care of you? That'll wear it. You'll, you, you may be passed from family to family to family. People get tired of taking care of you. And uh, that will run out. Society, our government will take care of you. Uh, for all those who want that route, then you're on your own. I, I would encourage you. Pastor Dan encourages you today. You need to come to a decision about your own life. There are many pathways to take for health and for healing, for deliverance. I know just, just next door, uh, AA meets here uh, five times a week. Uh, you, whatever it takes, whatever it takes for you to get, turn your life around and get control and take control back, uh, we would like to say that in addition to the other quality steps you take, uh, invite the Lord to be your personal Savior. It's not a religious thing. We're not trying to build a church. We've both been uh, believers. I know I received the Lord uh, when I was five. And how old were you, young man? I was 12. 12 years old. And so it's not, we're not, we're, it's not the opiate of the masses. This is, this is, he is within us, taking us through all of our life and people of, in any strata in life, in any situation in life, you need to receive the Lord. That's a starting point. So you have a friend that the Bible says stays closer than a brother, will never leave you, never forsake you. And he has the power in his spirit to defeat any addiction, of any kind and set you straight. Not always overnight, not always with a snap of a finger do you, is your life change, but, but His Spirit can lead you into health and healing. I wish we had time to talk about uh, uh, the great three-pointers that Dan and I <laughs> shot in, in college. Uh, 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 he, he's he's um, one of the best. He was telling, telling me some stuff about these three pointers he was shooting the other day. I, I'm not sure if you had too much apple cider or not. You actually told me you made 26 in a row. Was that? Did I mishear you on the phone? You were in Bozeman. Uh, that was a record. 26 in a row. If I was to shoot a three pointer now, I'd have to mail it in. That's a long, long. That was long before way. my stroke, though. <laughs> well, Dan did have a stroke uh, three years ago. Three years ago, and and, and when we were out in Seattle. And, you, oh, you had time even walking at that point and talking and, and God has helped you along and, uh, and we thank God for that. Thank God for your wife letting you uh, come down from Bozeman and thank you again for your service for our country. Thank you for the war that you fought down on First Avenue in the big city of Seattle. Thank you for watching. We, we just hope that, hope and pray that we've been, encouraged you. There's no pat answers. It's no easy answer. And do not give in and do not give up in the addictions of any kind that Christ would have us be overcomers. Thanks for watching and we appreciate you plugging in here to Believers 2021. The center, Daniel, this is what I tell him. This is the center of the known world. Great Falls, the great, great falls, Montana. Mm -hmm. And Dan agrees. Thank you for watching.